perhaps you've heard lately that there's a 13th sign of the zodiac. Certainly I've had several people ask me about that just lately. But the press coverage has been pretty bad, so we ought to really look at it and see what this means. We can't really understand the question without understanding the distinction between a constellation and a sign. Now constellations were typically we think of as star pictures and the lines that connect up the stars make a picture and we visualize those and remember the stars that way. That's really a very ancient concept. In fact, the ancient star catalogs that we have describe the stars by their places within star pictures. The ancient astronomer Ptolemy, for example, describes the stars in his catalog one by one by their places in the star pictures. So for example, here is the constellation of Aquila the Eagle, and those stars have their places there in the head and the tail and the wings. And over here is the constellation Ophiuchus. Ptolemy describes that star, Ras al Agwe, as the head. So that's the head of the star picture of the giant Ophiuchus there in the sky. So the star picture is one way to understand a constellation. But it has the disadvantage that you have to understand what the picture is and why one star is the foot or the head or an arm or a leg. The modern concept of constellations, which dates from 1922 with the International Astronomical Union, is to draw constellations as areas of the sky. A constellation is the area within a certain border. So if a star is on one side of the borderline, then it belongs to Ophiuchus. On the other side, it belongs there to Scorpius. No star is left out. Every star has a place in the sky somewhere there. That's the modern concept, which is pretty much irrelevant in historical context because that's such a modern way of thinking about it, although that is how you'll find stars described today in typical star catalogs. So which of these constellations then are the constellations of the zodiac? Well, we have to understand that the sun seems to make a path through the sky from west to east as the Earth orbits around it. And that path through the sky is called the ecliptic. There it is, the red line there. So the sun follows this path through the sky, and we also find the moon and planets always somewhere in the vicinity of that line in the sky of the ecliptic. The constellations that the line passes through are the constellations of the zodiac. So here you see some familiar ones there um, running uh, along the line. For example, Scorpius right there, and Sagittarius, and Capricornus, and Aquarius. There's a strip of the zodiac. We always find the sun, moon, and planet somewhere in the vicinity of those constellations. Already in antiquity, astronomers made a formal system in which the constellations were standard signs of, of 30 degrees each, 12 standard signs, each occupying the same distance along the zodiac rather than the angle of the individual constellations, which vary in size. Those are the signs of the zodiac, not necessarily the constellations, and the constellation pictures at that point become almost this irrelevant. Is this is all complicated by something called the precession of the equinoxes. Today we know that the Earth behaves like a giant gyroscope. Its rotational axis sweeps out a circle that takes about 26,000 years to complete, which means that the apparent direction of north compared to the stars changes over many, many years. If we go back and look at the sky about 6,000 years ago and mark the direction of true north pointed to by the Earth's axis with that yellow cross right there, it's pretty far away from that blue dot, which is today's pole star. But a thousand years later, the shift is apparent and the pole star has approached true north and then yet another thousand years and yet another thousand years eventually we'll see that the pole star coincides pretty closely with true north and that actually coincides with today around the year 2000 but look a thousand years into the future and the pole star has shifted further away and still further away and those poor people 2000 years from now like 6000 years ago won't have a true pole star that's the precession of the equinoxes so we've seen what the precession of the earth's axis does near the poles what does that have to do with the equinoxes? Well, here once again we have the path showing the Sun's motion and here's the celestial equator in blue. The Sun spends half of the year south of the celestial equator and half of the year north of the celestial equator and when it crosses 
here going from south to north, that's the vernal equinox. Vernal equinox for a very long time has been used to mark the beginning of the year as well as the beginning of those sets of signs that we've been talking about. The vernal equinox occurs in late March, conventionally March 21st or so. Well, but you'll notice that here that I've set the sky up for about 4,000 years ago and the, the vernal equinox is happening here in western Taurus. We're going to advance time a thousand years at a time from 4,000 years ago. We're going to see that the vernal equinox moves westward through Aries and along through Pisces, a considerable motion across the sky. Let's try it. First, advance 1,000 years. Watch where the vernal equinox goes. Shifted from there to here. Let's advance another thousand years. The vernal equinox shifts over here to Pisces, the, the eastern side of Pisces. Add a thousand years. We end up over here, getting towards the western side of Pisces. And another thousand years brings us to our current date, 2011. The vernal equinox is all the way over here. So over 4,000 years, the vernal equinox has moved from western Taurus through Aries across Pisces and is headed for Aquarius. You know the song. Well, this motion of the equinox, of the vernal equinox, the autumnal equinox does it too, this motion was discovered by the ancient Greek astronomer Hipparchus, who lived about 300 years before Ptolemy, or around 150 BC. His work, based on much more ancient records, which he had available to him, showed him that the equinox was indeed making this slow motion which would take he knew many thousands of years to complete. Well, we know that that's the motion of the earth, the wobble of the earth's axis, the precession. For the ancients it wasn't so clear and it introduced an immediate problem which is that if the equinox is the beginning of your sequence of signs but if that starting point is moving then the constellations won't match the signs unless the signs move too. And this is where a branch point occurred. That is that the astrologers decided to ignore the constellations so that their signs didn't have to move with precession. Whereas astronomers allowed the astronomical signs to shift westward with the equinoxes. This was standard, but remember that the conventional picture was that the stars were out on a sphere out beyond Saturn. And this motion of precession was considered to be a motion of the stars. So the stars were moving eastward, not the equinox moving westward, as we now understand it with the wobble of the Earth. So this eastward motion of the stars meant that the signs of the constellations, the astronomical conventional signs would have to be adjusted for precession. Where did that leave the astrological signs? Well, they must be back there too, but they're invisible. You can see that on this 16th century diagram in which we see highlighted the starry sphere, the sphere carrying the stars, and surrounding it is the next sphere out and both of them show the signs that we associate with the zodiac but one of them what the one with the stars is showing you the astronomical signs and the one without the stars is showing you the astrological signs and notice that the edges of the signs don't match up there's a shift and that is the shift of precession the, the invisible signs in the background standing still and the normal starry signs that we see in the sky shifting in the foreground. So is that slipping of the equinoxes as they move across the sky there with the precession of the Earth's axis of rotation, is that motion of the equinoxes responsible for Ophiuchus suddenly being described as a sign of the zodiac? Well, Ophiuchus never was a sign of the zodiac in antiquity and the signs were just conventions 
anyway. So um, with 12 conventional signs that cover the entire sky, there's no need to have a sign of Ophiuchus. But let's just see whether the precession of the equinoxes has changed the relationship of the ecliptic here to the constellation. Here again is Scorpius right here. Here's Ophiuchus, and this leg of Ophiuchus these days is crossed by the ecliptic. So Venus is right over there, and then here's Sagittarius. But what did it look like 4,000 years ago? Let's jump back 4,000 years and see. Here we are. Here is Scorpius. Here's Ophiuchus, and look at that. The ecliptic goes right through this southern part of Ophiuchus, and here is Sagittarius, and this is 4,000 years ago. So the sky basically is the same now as it was 4,000 years ago in respect of the ecliptics crossing through Ophiuchus, which means the sun, moon, and planets also cross through Ophiuchus. Just to catch up real quickly, we'll go forward 1,000 years. No big change. Forward another thousand years. No big change. Forward another thousand years. Again, basically the same. And back to our own time. And here we are. So over 4,000 years of precessional motion, Ophiuchus has not changed its position significantly with respect to the ecliptic. So there's no reason now to suddenly decide Ophiuchus is a sign of the zodiac. Of course, astrologers have been ignoring Ophiuchus anyway for however many thousand years. It's not one of the signs, so it's not one of the places that they talk about the sun, moon, and planets being, even though the sun, moon, and planets do move through Ophiuchus and have uh, for basically all of astronomical history. So if you believe any of that nonsense at all, you still don't have to worry about introducing Ophiuchus. So forget about the astrological stuff and keep your eyes on the skies. Go out and take a look at the neglected constellation Ophiuchus, which you can find early in these mornings in January, about an hour before sunrise. In fact, the planet Venus, which is currently in Ophiuchus, will happily guide you there. It's the brightest object over there in the pre-dawn eastern sky. You find Venus, you'll find Ophiuchus just above Venus right up here standing also above Scorpius, the bright star Antares right there, and further off to the um, north you see the bright star Vega. Draw a line from Vega down to Antares and Venus and you'll pass right through Ophiuchus. So get out there and take a look.